Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will present Exalt, a library that gives back to researchers the ability to test the scalability of today's large storage systems. And this is a joint work with my colleagues at the University of Texas at Austin. As a researcher in computer science, we are continuously experiencing this cycle. We need to design our system, when they, then we need to implement our ideas in a prototype, then we need to evaluate our prototype to give feedbacks to our design and implementation. And we usually need to experience this cycle for multiple times until we can achieve our original goals. But when applied to large-scale storage systems, things become much harder. The fundamental issue here is that researchers usually don't have enough resources to run their prototypes at full scale. Nowadays, a typical industrial deployment can already have tens of petabytes of data and thousands of nodes, and these two numbers are growing fast, mainly because the quality of data is still growing. On the other hand, for our researchers, even hundreds of terabytes of space and hundreds of nodes are not easy to get. That is why many of the recent works are evaluated with only hundreds of servers, and they include my own work and even Google's prototype spanner. So in this talk, I will try to address this problem. How can we validate the scalability of a storage system? Actually, one standard way in distributed systems is to extrapolate a large-scale result from an observable result on a smaller testbed. For example, if with 100 nodes we can observe that the network is 10% utilized and uh, the CPU is 5% utilized, then we can extrapolate that our system can scale to 1,000 nodes. However, in order for this approach to work in practice, we have to rely on the assumption that the resource consumption grows linearly with the scale of the system, which may not always hold in practice. Sometimes we can see that the problem only occurs when the scale of the system reaches a certain limit. Sometimes we can observe that the resource consumption grows super linearly with the scale of the system, and such trend is not obvious when the scale of the system is small. So we are wondering, can we give up all such inaccurate approaches and really run our prototypes at a full scale, of course, with a few machines? To achieve that, first we need to collocate multiple processes on the same physical machine. And collocation itself turns out to be not hard thanks to virtual machine techniques. The real challenge here is that simple collocation does not buy us much, mainly because in a storage system, the bottleneck is usually the I.O. resources. So for example, if we're without collocation, a process may write to a disk with a speed of 100 megabytes per second. If we collocate three processes on the same disk, then each of them can only write with a speed of 33 megabytes per second. So they cannot run at their full speed, and therefore we still cannot push our system to its limit. So how can we address this problem? Uh, since we have no magic way to increase the I.O. resource in a test bed, we are wondering, can we significantly reduce the resource requirement of each process without somewhere disfiguring its perform, profiling the present to the rest of the system? Well, this is almost impossible in general, but in storage systems, there's one key observation that allows us to achieve that. The observation is that in a storage system, it is typically the case that the data content doesn't affect the, the system behavior. For example, if we write something to a local disk or to a local file system, the actual bytes of the data don't affect how the system executes because they simply treat data as a black box. What really matters is that metadata, such as the length of the data, or where we perform the read and write. This motivates us to use synthetic data at the client side and abstract away such data on all the I.O. devices. This will allow us to significantly reduce the resource requirement of each process, so that even if it is co-located with many others, it can still run at full speed. But of course, now the question is how can we abstract away data? The simplest approach is to discard data completely. And uh, this approach is actually used in a previous work called David, which is developed by, at uh, Wisconsin. And uh, they have successfully applied this idea to evaluate local file systems on future devices, such a very large solid state disk. But one quickly finds that this approach doesn't work well with uh, large scale storage systems, mainly because these systems usually have multiple layers. For example, Bigtable stores its own data on Google's file system, and so are HBase and HDFS. So in such a multi-layer storage system, 
the upper layers usually store its own metadata as the data on the lower layers. In this case, it is not fine for the lower layers to simply discard data because it will also discard the important metadata from the upper layers. In this case, of course, the upper layer will not function correctly. Our answer to this question is uh, we should compress data instead of completely discarding data. And since compression is a well-studied field, when we wonder whether we can use existing algorithms like GZIP, uh, to answer such questions, let me first present the requirements of our compression algorithm. So the first three requirements are pretty straightforward. First, our algorithm should be CPU efficient because we don't want to replace an IO bottleneck with a new CPU bottleneck. And actually, this one rules out those general purpose algorithms like GZIP because they are pretty CPU heavy. And second, our algorithm should be able to achieve a very high compression ratio because we want to collocate many processes on the same machine. And third, our algorithm should be lossless because we cannot lose metadata. The final requirement is uh, a bit subtle. We require that our algorithm should be able to work with mixed data and metadata. Uh, let me elaborate what it means exactly. Okay. The major challenge here is that despite the fact that uh, we have full control over client's data, the system itself may still add metadata or insert metadata into data. And examples would include uh, a timestamp or a checksum and so on. And this part is out of our control. What is worse, the system itself sometimes splits such data plus metadata in a non-deterministic way and then send it to the lower layers. This means that when the lower layers receive some input, it does not know where the metadata is. So the key of our algorithm is that can we design the data, client data pattern in a way that we can efficiently locate the inserted metadata. For that purpose, we have designed a specific data pattern and a co corresponding compression algorithm called TARDIS. And we use the name TARDIS because it can achieve a very efficient space and time compression. So first, to locate metadata inside data, at least we need to ensure that the data is distinguishable from metadata. To achieve that, we introduce the specific sequence of bytes called a flag that does not appear in metadata. And then the question is how can we efficiently locate metadata? As we have learned in our algorithm class, it is usually easy to locate something in a sorted array because we can use binary search. This suggests that we should design our tightest pattern to follow a sorted pattern so that we can easily locate metadata. To achieve that, we introduce another sequence of bytes called a marker, which is an integer representing the number of remaining bytes to the end of the data trunk. And actually, our TARDIS pattern is a combination of flag and marker, in which the flag will allow such data pattern to be distinguishable from metadata, even if it is split. And the marker will allow such data pattern to follow a sorted pattern so that we can use binary search. So for example, if a client is trying to write one kilobyte of data, this is how it looks like, assuming both flags and markers are four bytes. It will start by a flag and then followed by a number 1016, which means that there are 1016 bytes remaining, and then another flag and 1008, and so on. Now let's see how can we locate metadata inside data. Here we'll just use an example which consists of the second half of the data trunk from the previous example plus some metadata which is in yellow here and then also some bytes from the next data trunk. Our algorithm will start by searching for flag, then it will try to retrieve the marker of the flag, and then it will try to skip this 504 bytes directly. But before it can actually perform the skip, it will make a check. It will check that the previous eight bytes must be a flag followed by zero. If this is true, then we know that there's no inserted metadata. And of course, if it is not true, we will use binary search to locate the inserted metadata. So in this simple example, we will simply compress those bytes into a more compacted format, which contains only two integers. The first one identifies the starting point of the data trunk, and the second one is the length of the data trunk. And then we will search for flag again. Here we will find that the flag is not adjacent to the end of the previous data trunk which means that there must be some metadata inserted. So in this case, we will simply copy the metadata here because it's just a small. And then we will search for retrieve the marker and try to skip again. And here, of course, we will hit the end of the data trunk and we will compress it again. 
The benefit of this protocol is that, assuming the size of the data is much larger than the size of the metadata, then this algorithm can avoid scanning most of the bytes in the input, which makes it very CPU efficient. In our experiment, it is about 33,000 times faster than gzip when compressing one megabyte of data. But of course, this is not an apple to apple comparison, mainly because the gzip is a general purpose algorithm. But this simply shows that by choosing our own data format appropriately, we can significantly reduce the overhead of compression. However, in order for this algorithm to be lossless, the flag cannot appear in metadata. Otherwise, some metadata may be misclassified as data and we will lose it. And of course, now the question is how can we find such an appropriate flag? One may want to approach that scans all the possible metadata and then try to find some bias that does not exist in it. But this turns out to be quite difficult and expensive. And actually, we find that in practice, we can use a much simpler approach based on the observation that TARDIS is actually only used for testing. Therefore, even if our chosen flag does appear in the metadata and cause the system to stop working, we can simply uh, choose another flag and restart the test. And we find that in practice, a randomly chosen 8 byte flag works for both HDFS and HBase. Now we have this powerful tool, TARDIS. Let's see how can we use it to achieve our original goal, which is to test the scalability of our prototype. For that purpose, we run most of our nodes in emulated mode, which means that they are co-located with many others on the same machine. But we also run a few nodes in real mode, which means that they are not co-located with others. So such combination works as a magnifier glass so that we can focus on the part that are not emulated. And to better, understanding the, to better understand the scalability of the system, we usually run those potential bottleneck nodes in real mode. In such a setting, the client will send TARDIS data pattern to all nodes, while the emulated mode will run TARDIS compression and decompression on all its I.O. devices, while the real node will just run with unmodified data. While running most of the nodes in emulated mode will allow us to get enough pressure on the bottleneck node, while running the bottleneck node in real mode will allow us to get an accurate measurement on the throughput of the bottleneck, which is uh, critical to the scalability of the system. We have implemented the emulated devices for disk network and memory, and we have been able to provide transparent emulation for both disk and network by using Java's bytecode instrumentation, and the usage is very simple. We just need to add an option to the Java command line. But we have not been able to provide the memory compression in a transparent way yet, mainly because in Java, there's no clear interface for memory accesses. Therefore, for applications that uh, stores a lot of objects in memory, uh, we need to ha manually modify the code. Our experience is that HDFS, for example, does not require memory compression at all because it does not use a lot of memory. HBase, on the other hand, stores a lot of objects in memory, and supporting memory compression requires the 71 lines of code modification. Uh, as an evaluation, we have applied our emulator to HDFS and HBase, which are two widely used open source uh, large scale storage systems. Uh, we measure their scalability, and whenever we find a problem, we analyze its root cause and try to fix it. So here I can only show some of the graphs from HDFS. Uh, this is a scalability graph of HDFS. Okay? HDFS is a typical sharding system. It has a single metadata service called name node, which is usually believed to be the bottleneck of the system. And it also has a large number of data nodes to store the actual data. Therefore, obviously, we should apply emulation to all the data nodes and run the name node in real mode. In this graph, the x-axis is the number of emulated data nodes, and we have actually achieved a collocation ratio of 1 to 100. For example, to run the 9.6K experiment, we only need 96 physical machines. And the y-axis is the aggregate throughput, which is measured in gigabytes per second. And here I also draw an ideal throughput line, which means that the throughput grows exactly linearly as the number of servers. And in the experiment, we just add the number of data nodes to the system and measure the throughput to see how the line fits well with this ideal line. Okay. And actually, we find that uh, our system quickly saturated with about 1K data nodes. Uh, by some profiling and searching online, we find that the problem is actually because the default number of RPC threads is too small on name node for a large setting. Okay. 
After fixing that, our system can continue scale to about uh, 300 gigabytes per second. And once again, we want to know the reason. And our profiling shows that now the problem is in the logging system of name node. Name node needs to log two types of information to disks. One is the metadata operations that it has already executed, and the other one is some debug information. And it is suggested that they should be logged to separate disks, but unfortunately, our test machine only has a single disk. So we decided to put the debug information in TempFS because it is not critical to the execution of the system. After fixing this, our system can scale to a throughput of about 400 gigabytes per second. This number is the same as reported by HDFS developers who did their own experiment in the large cluster in Facebook. And we were able to reproduce the same result with only 96 machines. But after this point, we want to further investigate whether we can improve HDFS. And our profiling shows that now the problem is still in the logging system of NameNode. And since we have no magic way to increase the speed of the disk, we're just wondering that maybe in the future we will have some very fast devices like uh, persistent memories. To emulate these such cases, we also put the metadata log in TempFS. Okay, we find that after fixing that, our system can achieve a throughput of 600 gigabytes per second. And now, at this point, the problem is in the synchronization of different threads on the node, and fixing it would require a significant redesign of the system, and that's why we decided to stop here. So apart from such uh, configuration problems, we also find a number of implementation problems in HDFS. For example, we find that HDFS can experience a pretty significant performance degradation as the size of a file grows large. This is actually pretty surprising because HDFS is actually designed for big files. Right? And actually our profiling shows that the problem is in this piece of code. Okay? Uh, when a name node needs to add a block to an existing file, it needs to compute the length of all the existing blocks. And in the current implementation, it uh, achieves this by scanning all the existing blocks. So of course, this operation will become heavier and heavier as the size of the file grows large. And our fix is pretty straightforward. We just add an integer to, the, to each file to record its existing length. And you can see that by applying our patch, HDFS does not experience this performance degradation anymore. Okay. So far, I have shown some experience about uh, applying Exo to, to widely used uh, storage systems. And in the meantime, we are also working on uh, how to extend Exo to actually support more kinds of applications and systems. For example, uh, first, uh, now Exo is mainly designed for I.O. intensive systems. And we are actually thinking about uh, using the time dilution idea in the diecast work also to support the CPU intensive systems. And the second, our emulator relies on the assumption that the applications and benchmarks are data insensitive so that we can put the target data format there. Uh, for those data sensitive applications and benchmarks, we are thinking about a, a traditional approach in storage evaluation. This approach would require one researcher to record the IO traces on a real large test bed, and then the other researchers can replace such IO traces in a smaller test bed, because during the replaying, they can use the target format there. The third question is, uh, what can we do if the target system modifies data? Now, of course, in that case, the target compression does not work. And actually, in the paper, we have, design, uh, we have designed several ad hoc solutions for certain kinds of detail application and encryption and so on. But we have to admit here that we don't have a general solution for this kind of problem. Okay. To conclude, in this work, I have presented a library called Exalt which gives back to researchers the ability to run their prototypes at industrial scale. And we have published our code online, and of course you are welcome to test and uh, use it. And uh, that's the end of my talk, and uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, so in your uh, in your system, you test a name node bottleneck, which is a single node. Have you tried other cases where multiple nodes t communicating together become bottleneck? And how efficient is your system in testing that cases? So first, uh, we have tested with other nodes. We have tested with, uh, we also tested data nodes. Actually, we find that data nodes can also experience some problems when 
uh, the number of data on it is uh, large. Uh, but uh, for now, that's a limitation in the work that we cannot detect problems that are caused by many nodes uh, like uh, cooperating together because we cannot run many nodes uh, like uh, in real mode because uh, our test value is limited by the number of machines. Yeah, that would be a limitation of the current work. Uh, and actually, we are, I think that if we can successfully apply the idea of diecast there, it might be able to solve this problem. Hey, Wyatt Lloyd, uh, Facebook and USC. Uh, so I think you might have just answered this a little bit, uh, but it seems like Exalt is a system uh, that tests uh, the test whether something is, whether it can necessarily scale. Uh, like if it doesn't scale in Exalt, like it's not gonna scale. Uh, do you think that it sort of gives you any indication if it will, it's sort of sufficient to scale? Whether it works in Exalt, it'll actually like work at uh, the scale of let's say 100,000 machines? Uh, so let me see in the ways. So Exalt will tell you that, uh, well, I would say that if, I'm convinced that if it tells me there's a problem, then probably there's a problem. Right. But uh, it cannot tell me that uh, there's no problem. I cannot make that promise. So that is, a, I think that is the same as uh, like any software testing. So it's really hard to like cover all the possible cases. So I think I can only try my best. I will write a lot of benchmarks to test my system. And I will also use like a realistic benchmarks from like industry to test my system. But of course, I cannot guarantee that that covers all the possible cases. Okay. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, uh, from LinkedIn, working on Voldemort, uh, no, no SQL valid, no SQL database. So my question is, uh, when when you are emulating a lot of servers, a lot of instances on single servers, have you considered about uh, bottleneck that it, that is caused by the um, like this much on the hardware itself, like uh, uh, net network cards and. Uh, uh, yeah, for I would say so far our implementation does not support that. We assume that we have like a normal disk and a very fast network, so then the network is not a bottleneck. Uh, but in the meantime, we are considering like uh, to do some modeling for disk and networks and to incorporate the modeling into our emulator. Uh, for example, I know that for disk modeling, there are some major, quite major like uh, simulators like disk sim, and as I said, uh, the previous work, David also incorporates disk modeling into our system. Uh, for network modeling, I have to admit that I'm not an expert on that, but I know that there are some like network simulator work in that. But I think the major challenge there for us is that uh, uh, for network modeling, we need to know the network topology or the configuration, and for our, once again, as a researchers in universities, it is really hard to get such kind of information. So I think it would be better if I could have a collaboration with some of the big companies. Thank you. Thank you.